Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The passage we'll talk about this morning is today's gospel in the sixth chapter of Mark. And as you can tell from the screen, we're going to be talking about spectacular entrances. And we can talk about a few of them here today. First of all, for uh, Jonathan and Jennifer, January 9th was a big day as Leah was born, making a spectacular entrance into their lives. And for Jonathan and Renee, it was April 23rd. That was the big day when their daughter, Stana, came into their lives. And we all know, anyone who's a parent knows, that when you have a child, when that child is born, everything changes. Almost all the time, it changes for the better. We know that there are some challenges too, but a spectacular entrance. And this morning, for Leah and for Stana, something incredibly special has happened. For into their lives this morning, God has made a spectacular entrance. When they were baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, the Lord himself entered their lives changing their lives in a flash, making them children of God, taking their sins away forever as far as the east is from the west and giving them new and eternal life that no one can take away. So when the Lord makes a spectacular entrance, that changes everything on a dime. Now, the other night... I was thinking about another spectacular entrance. Who here was watching the opening ceremony of the Olympics on Friday night? Anybody who saw that ceremony saw a truly spectacular entrance when the Queen of England, or someone dressed as the Queen of England, parachuted out of a helicopter and landed in the Olympic Stadium. Truly spectacular, along with James Bond. Who could experience that? And certainly the whole world watching was stunned by that spectacular entrance. But the main spectacular entrance we're going to talk about today is the one that occurred in today's gospel that we read about in Mark chapter 6. And we're going to read through that passage bit by bit here in the next few minutes. But we can ask the question about these spectacular entrances. What is it that brings us here today? We know for the parents of Leah and Stana, they came here today for the very specific reason of bringing their children into God's kingdom through the water of baptism. As we think about the queen, we know why the queen went to the Olympic Stadium on Friday night. She was there to officially start the Olympic Games. But how about us? Let's have a show of hands. Who came here to this house of God today to worship the Lord? Let's raise our hands. Who came here today to hear the word of God from the Lord himself? Of course, that's why we're here today. What a wonderful thing for us to celebrate. And as we are here on Baptismal Sunday, another reason why we can think we're here right now is because not only have Leah and Stana been baptized, but by the grace of God, we have been baptized as well. And we can be here and remember our own baptism and remember what the Lord has done to make us his children. But we've already talked about how the spectacular entrances of life can change everything in a flash, in a moment of time. How about some other questions we might ask? How about people who have gone through stress? We don't even need to raise our hands for this. Maybe some people come to church because they are suddenly stressed out by an event in their lives. And we certainly know the impact that one event can suddenly have on a number of people. It was just oh, about a week ago that that terrible incident happened in Aurora, Colorado, where people were just innocently going about their business. 
watching the premiere of the Batman movie. And then in a flash, in an instant, in comes a man crazed for whatever reason who shoots and shoots and shoots and 12 people die. 58 are injured and the lives of all the families and everyone in that community and even people around our country and the world have been impacted and changed in a flash in a stunningly disappointing way. Sometimes things do happen to us that are terrible and by the grace of God, we can come to the house of God and hear the message of the Lord's word that is the only message that can give us comfort when something so unspeakably horrible happens. And of course, those grand shocking things aren't the only things that happen that can inspire us to come to God's house to receive comfort because some of us have lost jobs. Some of us have illnesses or illnesses among our loved ones. There are circumstances that come into our lives that change everything, that inspire us to be here. So it is good for us to be here today. Now, we could have raised our hands for a number of the negative things that, uh, that could bring us here, but of course we don't need to do that. And one thing we can all say, it's very, very easy for us to be here in God's house for the right reason. But we can be distracted and we can easily miss the point of what God is trying to communicate to us through his word because of what's going on in our lives right now that's filling our hearts and minds. But do you think that that kind of situation where we come to God's house to hear God's word, but we're distracted and we don't understand it and don't get it, is that something that only happens right now? Of course, we know that's not the case at all. And in fact, that is exactly the kind of situation that did happen in today's gospel in Mark chapter 6. Because when you look at the lives of Jesus' disciples, if you go back a little bit in Mark to understand today's gospel as it's printed in the bulletin as Pastor Hudak read it, you really have to go back and take a look at the earlier verses of Mark 6 to find out what was going on with the disciples. And what you see when you read all of chapter 6 is that Jesus' disciples had been going through an incredible day, a day filled with multiple ups and downs. They were all over the map, like riding a roller coaster for 24 hours. So their day was a day that had tremendous highs, but also included really tough stress. What happened was Jesus was preaching to a huge crowd of thousands of people, as Pastor Hudak was talking about when he took the kids on their road trip to see the window with the five loaves and the two fish. Jesus preached to these people all day long, and as it was getting to the end of the day, they were out in the middle of nowhere. They were out in the wilderness. And Jesus' disciples were getting really stressed about this because they knew there were going to be thousands of really hungry people who had no place to get any food. So they went to Jesus and they said, Lord, it's getting late. There's no food here. You better send these people away so that they can find some food. What was Jesus' response? So they were stressed already. Then Jesus' response to them was to say, no, you feed them. Well, their stress level had to fly off the charts. So he said, there's nothing here. He said, find whatever you've got. So they found a boy who had the five loaves and the two fish. And there were 5,000 men, not even counting the women and children. So there could easily have been 10,000 or more people at this gathering. But of course, we know what happens next. They were totally stressed. Jesus wasn't at all. And what did Jesus do? He took the five loaves and the two fish, and he blessed them, and he handed it to the disciples, who then went out and handed this food to the people to the point that every single person ate and was totally satisfied. And 
On top of that, there were 12 baskets full of fish and loaves, even after everyone had been fed. What a spectacular miracle. How on earth did this happen? And did the disciples see this? They sure did. So they went from the depths of stress to the heights of wonder and marvel. What on earth is going on here? But then no sooner had that happened, no sooner had they had that exhilarating experience than everything turned on a dime in a moment. As you can see where Mark picks up the gospel today in verse 45. Mark writes, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into a boat and go before him to the other side of the sea to Bethsaida. And then Jesus immediately dismissed the crowd. After Jesus took leave of them, he went up on a mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea and Jesus was alone on the land. So the disciples hardly had time to even begin to process this incredible miracle that they've seen. And Jesus literally forced them to get on a boat and go out into the water. What on earth is happening there? They had to be thinking, why is this happening? Why was Jesus in such a hurry? To find out the answer, you have to go to John's gospel as he fills in some of the blanks in this account. And John lets us know that that huge crowd of people was just as impressed by the miracle as Jesus' disciples were. In fact, they were so impressed that they wanted to pick Jesus up right then and there and carry him away and make him their king with the thought that Jesus would lead them to overthrow the hated Romans so that Israel could finally be free. They could have political freedom and live as they would choose. But of course, we know from the Gospels, that's not why Jesus came at all. He didn't come to be a political leader or a general. So Jesus wanted to nip this in the bud immediately. And he didn't want his disciples to catch wind of this at all. That's why he pushed them, almost pushed them, into the boat and said, go, get out on that water and go to Bethsaida, I'll see you later. And then he dismissed the crowd, sent them away immediately so that they couldn't force him to do something he had no intention of doing. And then Jesus went up into the hills to pray to God the Father. And of course, then they come to the middle of the night and the disciples were in another situation where everything is changing in a flash in a minute. Kind of like we all experienced a few mornings ago at 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning, who of us here was not awakened when there was the huge gush of wind that came and battered our houses and knocked out power to thousands and thousands of people? In an instant, we all woke up. What is going on? Well, that was what was happening on the Sea of Galilee, a place where sudden storms blow up. And remember, that these men, many of Jesus' disciples, were very experienced fishermen on that body of water. They were used to this situation. But a storm so bad came up, and in the dark, they couldn't see where they were, and all of a sudden, a terrible storm whips the waves, and their, their ship is going to capsize. They're going to sink out in the middle of the water, miles and miles from shore. What were they going to do? So here, they've had highs and lows and highs and lows, and here's yet another low. How are they going to make it? Are they all going to drown? So they're terrified by the situation. Well, Jesus can see this happening. So what does Jesus do? Jesus actually literally walks out to them on the roiling waters. And they can see him, and this is an interesting picture of it here. They can see them. Now, they see this guy walking on the water. They don't know it's Jesus. So what's their reaction to that? Oh my gosh, we're in this terrible storm, we're gonna sink, we're gonna die. And on top of it, there's this specter, this ghost 
is walking right toward us. How can things get any worse? And that's when Jesus stepped in and he said something to them. He said to them, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Those had to be incredibly comforting words in and of themselves. But this is actually a case where the English translations of the Bible are a little bit lacking. Because when you look at the original Greek, which will pop up here, you can see the, the top part is Greek. And the key words I have highlighted and underlined there, it says ego, I me, ego, like the word for I. And what that literally means is I am. The more proper translation is Jesus said to them, be brave, be of good cheer, I am. Stop fearing immediately. This is a passage that's really filled with far more meaning than meets the eye because Jesus was literally telling them that he, God himself, the creator and controller of the universe, was with them in that moment of time. How do we understand this? We understand what this means by turning back our Bible to Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. And we remember that time when Moses was speaking to God. God was talking to Moses from the burning bush. And what did God tell Moses? God told Moses, Moses, you are going to go to Egypt and you are going to be the one who leads my people Israel out of their slavery to the Egyptians and into the promised land. And we know Moses was afraid. He didn't think he was up to the job. He was making excuses to avoid it. And there were no more excuses after a while as the conversation continued. And then Moses says, well, okay, if I go there, I need to know your name, God, so that when I go to the Israelites, I can tell them your name and they will know that I'm speaking for you. So God, what is your name? And that's when God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent you. So when Jesus came to the disciples on the water and said to them, I am, that was filled with, with an infinite amount of meaning. Because by saying those words and applying them to himself, Jesus was telling them, I'm not just a miracle-working man who is with you, but I am. He was taking the name of God. So in Jesus, God was telling them, God himself, the creator, is with you to rescue you. His name, Jesus, literally means I am, or God, saves. He was coming to them in the storm and the extreme stress of their lives. So in light of that, how could they possibly be afraid anymore? And of course, they couldn't. So Mark wraps up this part of the passage by saying, Jesus got into the boat, making his spectacular entrance, a more spectacular entrance we can hardly imagine. And immediately the wind ceased and they were utterly astounded. So what does it all mean to us today? The application for us is clear. Namely, that in the challenges, the problems, the crises, even the tragedies of our lives, Jesus, I am, saves, is with us to carry us through. First of all, again, on this baptismal weekend, we're reminded that in the water of our baptism, not only have Leah and Stana been marked with the eternal seal of the Lord's forgiveness and his presence, 
But all of us who have been baptized are reminded that we belong to God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God has imprinted his presence on us in that spectacular entrance that he made into our lives. Then in some of the most comforting imagery of the Bible, Jesus speaks of himself as constantly being with us in some comforting ways. So he talks of himself as being our good shepherd and he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Jesus knows each of us by name. He is aware of all the circumstances of our lives. So even if there are circumstances that come upon us suddenly that make us feel helpless, that make us feel as if we're on our own, we are not at all. That's the sure promise of Jesus as he tells us in his own word. He says in Matthew 11, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. More often than not, as we're living day by day, we carry on in our lives, not necessarily thinking, I need Jesus' help right now. But all of us do face those times when things get beyond our control, and that's when it's easy for us to panic. But Jesus' reminder is always there for us that we can come to him when we're feeling burdened by what's going on. And again, his promise is that he always gives us rest by bearing us up. In fact, Jesus doesn't only bear us up, but he actually bears in his own flesh the pains, the sins, the difficulties of our lives. We are not alone in any of the worst circumstances. As the prophet Isaiah described the ministry of Jesus on our behalf long in advance when the prophet wrote, surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. He carries the difficult times in our lives. How often when we're stressed, we pour out our hearts in prayer and wonder if God is there, if he's aware Jesus reminds us again in Matthew 5 that when we go off to God and we pour out our secret hearts to him, our Father who sees us all the time, who sees us in secret, he hears everything that we're saying. He knows exactly what is going on in our lives and of course he knows everything that you and I need. And finally, when Jesus was leaving this earth prior to his ascension into heaven, he said to all of his followers, and of course, this includes us today too, he said, and let's read these words together, surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. So, no matter what's happening in our lives, Jesus is with us. He is present, and his love in his compassion and in his power. He is walking with us, whether we're celebrating as the families are celebrating baptism today, or whether we're stressed by the circumstances of our lives, and even if we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. He is there, and the key for us is to recognize that and to be open to him, as Jesus says in words of Revelation 3.20. Let's read these together. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Jesus is speaking that to you and to me right now. How great is that? Amen. Now the peace of God which passes all understanding Keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.